I've been playing around with RC vehicles for a few years now, including boats and cars. But one thing I've always wanted to do is explore with these vehicles. What I mean is drive beyond my line of sight, explore remote waterways, traverse national parks. So I've tried a few things. A phone on board so I can control it over the phone network, which became a Raspberry Pi with a cellular modem, and some real antennas to get better range. This worked fairly well, but reliable mobile coverage could sometimes be a problem. A few months ago, I came across something incredible, Starlink for in-motion use. Suddenly the dream of having a vehicle with unlimited range anywhere on Earth could be a reality. I could, theoretically at least, build a boat which could cross the ocean and stream video the whole time. I could drive a rover into the depths of the Australian outback and maybe do a few laps of a salt lake. With an amphibious vehicle, I could explore uninhabited islands live from the comfort of my home. Hmm, maybe I was overestimating my building abilities, but all of these things were suddenly technically feasible. They were starting to become economically feasible too. Despite still being pretty expensive, this was dramatically cheaper than just a few months ago with the maritime offering, and it was on special too. For someone really interested in this hobby, the dream of RC exploration could be had for the price of a new laptop. So I did the only reasonable thing and hit the buy button. A few days later, the Starlink dish arrived. It came with the dish itself, affectionately known as Dishy, an AC power supply, a Wi-Fi router, a mounting bracket, and a bunch of cables. First, I wanted to see what kind of performance I could get out of it, just stationary in my backyard. I considered this to be a pretty challenging environment, with metal fences, trees, and a veranda. For initial testing, I wired up the power supply to the Dishy, and then to the Wi-Fi router. I then connected to the router with my phone. After an initial wait for it to start up, the performance was impressive. Way faster than my wired home internet, in fact, and with comparable latency. I guess low Earth orbit isn't really that far in the scheme of things. Now onto the power test. It seems to draw around 200 watts when trying to initially connect, and also when transmitting or receiving at high bandwidth. And around 80 watts just idling. That factored into my first design decision. How do I power this? Now ideally I could use a nice, cheap, efficient DC to DC converter to power this from a battery except the Dishy has this proprietary connector. So it looks like I'll have to use the power supply it came with, as well as an inverter to convert my battery voltage up to 230 volt AC for the power supply to drop it back down to the 49 volt DC that the Dishy needs. A bit wasteful, but it is what it is. Next up, to select a battery. Let's assume the Starlink is drawing 120 watts. To get a ballpark for motor power usage, let's look at the Blue Robotics Blue Boat, which is roughly a similar size to what I expect this boat to be. At 1 meter per second cruise, they state it consumes roughly 30 watts. So that's 150 watt total for the Starlink and the motors. Let's say we want the boat to run for about 4 hours. At 1 meter per second, this is 14 kilometers range. At 150 watts, that means a battery capacity of 600 watt hours. We need around 12 to 13 volt input for the inverter, so 600 watt hours is equivalent to a 50 amp hour capacity. Everything from these back of the envelope numbers seemed to point to a 50 amp hour lithium iron phosphate deep cycle battery. All of this led to an initial weight estimate of about 25 kilos. The plan was to build the simplest, most robust boat I could think of to support this weight. Catamaran hulls for stability, made out of foam so they couldn't spring a leak. Fiberglass on the outside for extra strength and impact resistance. A waterproof tub would be suspended up above the two hulls, containing all the electronics and the Starlink dish on top. Off-the-shelf thrusters would be mounted to the bottom of each hull so I could differentially steer without the need for a rudder. Minimal penetrations into the tub would be needed, one for each thruster and one for the Starlink dish. So I started by buying a cheap, clear, waterproof tub and laying out the components inside to make sure everything would fit and also to check the balance left and right to make sure it wouldn't list to one side or tilt forward and back. Next, I built a plywood platform for the tub to sit on and bolted it to these aluminium cross pieces, which will then get bolted down onto each hull. I then prepared the XPS foam pieces, which would form each hull, by cutting them into strips and then making square cutouts for some plywood inserts. These inserts formed an anchor piece on each side of the hull, for the threaded rods to bolt down onto. This provides some surface area within the hull, so that the rods don't wiggle and carve out the foam during use. 
Based on the buoyancy calculations for a 25 kilo mass, I needed four layers of this five centimeter thick XPS foam to allow the boat to sit at a reasonable height in the water, about halfway up the hull. I glued each of these layers together with Gorilla Glue and used the threaded rods to align them together. Gorilla Glue is an expanding foam, so I placed weights on top to keep the layers together as it dried overnight. I laser cut these MDF templates and bolted them down onto the top and bottom of each hull. With these, I could use a hot wire cutter to get a really clean, accurate, symmetric curve on the side of the hull. My local makerspace was instrumental in being able to do this project at all, with access to tools like the laser cutter, band saws, drill presses, a table saw and angle grinders, as well as the expertise of the people there, giving me ideas and advice throughout the project. I 3D printed these pieces and glued them to the leading and trailing edges of each hull to provide some impact resistance on these thin, fragile parts of the hulls. Next came the most laborious part of this project, fiberglassing the outside of the hulls. I tinted the epoxy resin to a nice bright orange colour and painted it onto the fiberglass mat. If I was to do this again, I would probably just paint it after because the epoxy made a mess. The plywood pieces were also coated in this epoxy to waterproof them. So I'm using the Blue Robotics T200 thrusters here. I've got two of these, um, one on each hull for differential steering. And the cable on it needs to enter the tub somehow and ideally be waterproof. So I have 3D printed out of PLA these kind of gland seal things. Um, there's a split O-ring style thing out of TPU here that fits over the cable. And then this other piece made out of hard PLA has a gasket also made out of TPU and this goes over the cable and this will be on the other side of the tub so you have one of these on one side one on the other clamps down and then these two halves screw together I made these 3d printed motor mounts they've got two holes on them for mounting into the um, the hull itself uh, then two holes for the motor to actually mount onto and then one hole for the for the cable to go through down into the hull. Finally came the time to fit everything together. The aluminium square tubes were bolted down onto the threaded rods with a bit of coaxing from a hammer. The plywood base was then bolted down onto these. I printed some little TPU bumpers that position the tub in location and place this on top to make sure everything fit. Another plywood section went on top to mount the Starlink dishy. Now onto the inside of the tub. I hot glued some foam pieces in here to align the battery into the centre of the tub and also glued the power supply, inverter and other electronics. We have the camera at the front. This is the GPS and compass, like external compass for the RG Pilot. Uh, power switch, Raspberry Pi down there. And we've got the motor drivers are under there. Um, and then the power distribution board that uh, only the motor drivers are connected to that. So that lets me measure the battery voltage and the current going into the motors. And then I've got the uh, Pixhawk down there running Audrey Pilot. I developed a web app to control the boat from my phone or any other device with a web browser. The cool thing about this is that it uses WebRTC to connect directly to the boat over the internet, entirely peer-to-peer. -peer. It talks to the Pixhawk over the Mavlink protocol, similar to the official Mission Planner program. It's nowhere near as extensive as Mission Planner, but it performs most of the functions I need, such as showing live video, a map, speed and power information, and allowing both manual control and guided points with waypoint missions. Ultimately what I wanted to do with this boat was come up with missions. A goal to travel a certain distance, explore something otherwise inaccessible, circumnavigate something, 
So for the first mission, I wanted to explore this ship graveyard. The only way to get here was via boat, and this would be a great opportunity to test endurance and get some nice video of some shipwrecks. We got it in the water, and off it went for its first mission. I tried setting up the mission, but it needed a compass calibration. My web app didn't have that feature, so I had to get out my laptop and use Mission Planner. With that done, I was able to switch back to my phone and set an initial waypoint. Okay, back to the mission. I set up an initial mission plan to take me to the bend in the river, at which point I could plan the next steps based on the conditions. I had to take manual control to avoid this boy, or buoy for the Americans. I think the tide must have been coming in through this passage because my ground speed plummeted to about 0.2 meters per second. I tried to take manual control to see if I could fight the current by zigzagging, but trigonometry was not on my side. This whole time I had a throttle limit set to 50% because I found this was the sweet spot for efficiency. I had no way to change this in the web app controller, so I had to again take out my laptop and bump up the throttle limit. I was starting to make some progress. You can see the speed increasing here as well as the motor current, but now I had another problem. I could see boats and kayaks ahead of me. I wasn't sure if they were fishing or not. On the opposite shore, I could see what looked like a lot of people. I didn't know if they were fishing either, and I definitely didn't want to get tangled in anyone's line. With this and the strong currents through this passage, I made the call to call off the mission. I didn't want to take unnecessary risk, and I was already super happy that the boat even made it this far. I realised how insane it was that I had just remotely piloted this boat via satellites in space, comfortably sitting on a park bench and watching the live view on my phone. There would always be more opportunities to come back and complete the mission. So I turned back, with a mixture of disappointment and triumph as well as excitement for the next mission. The boat rounded the corner and became visible again in the distance. On the way back, I wanted to at least explore somewhere I hadn't been before, and made a little detour to this cutaway. It was quite calm and peaceful here, with no other traffic to contend with.
Content with that little detour, I continued back to the beach, taking care to avoid channel markers and the boardwalk here. So what had I learnt from this mission? The web app controller needed some tweaks, the ability to perform compass calibration, adjust the throttle limit, and show error messages on screen to assist with debugging. The video encoding also needed tweaking, I suspect it was dropping frames due to excessive bitrate settings on the encoder. I also needed to look into adaptive bitrate and other, more advanced features of the Pion WebRTC library, such as picture loss indication. Another big revelation dropped while making this video. SpaceX just released the Starlink Mini. This has the potential to address almost all of my complaints about the Starlink flat high performance. Namely, the cost of the kit, the monthly cost, power consumption, weight, and power delivery. The Mini runs straight off of 12 to 48 volt DC, so I could run it straight from the battery without the bulky power supply or inverter, saving even more weight and power consumption. But that's something for another video. Until then, thanks for watching.